Spirit of God, we pray that you continue to move in and through these words so that they might become your living word for us and that we might become your living witnesses. It's all things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are continuing through the very early parts of the gospel of according to Mark, and we hear that Jesus, throughout the very beginning of his ministry, is dealing with all sorts of what is often referred to as demons and unclean spirits. We're reading in chapter 1, verses 29 through 34. As soon as Jesus and the disciples left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and told him to come to her at once. He came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and then the fever left her, and she began to serve him. That evening, at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons, and the whole city gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases, and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. This is the word. Thanks be to God. There's a lot of ways to deal with that particular scripture passage. The one about Simon's mother being healed just to provide dinner could be a sermon all into itself <laughs> with all sorts of funny stories. But I'm not going to pick that up today. Some of you might be thankful or maybe you wish I would say something along. But today, as we celebrate Black History Month, we've been looking at the life and witness and theology and understanding of Howard Thurman. Last week, I talked a little bit about his background, his understanding, how he approached Scripture and why that was important to us at this time and place. What would someone who was living and worshiping and doing ministry in the you know, early 1930s through the 1960s have to offer for us today? But I believe because of his impact, who he was, and what he had to say... <coughs> We ought to listen to his story because it is strangely contemporary. See, the truth is Howard Thurman was the kind of person, the kind of person who had a tremendous story from humble roots in Daytona Beach, Florida, and yet wide-ranging impact. It was his students who had heard his understanding of the way the gospel was called to be lived out that led the civil rights movement, Dr. Martin Luther King, James Farmer, and others. And yet, the truth is, when you say Howard Thurman, very few people even know who he is. Now, we can bemoan that fact, or we can be reminded of the fact that we just never know the kind of impact we in our own lives might have. And so we are part of an ongoing story. I don't think he'd worry too much if he was around today going, well, folks don't know who I am. I'm not all that concerned. The truth of the matter, he was much more concerned about developing deeper spiritual life to deal with the troubles around us. He knew and understood that we could not face the troubles of our own day if we have not on some level dealt with the troubles in ourselves. Because it is easy to get torn up into the hatred and anger of our own time. I do want to mention, though, some of his professional highlights that I did not last week. It was in 1932 that he became the first dean of the Rankin Chapel at Howard University. He traveled broadly throughout his life as a Christian missionary on different speaking engagements and during his life had the opportunity to meet with Mahatma Gandhi. And when he met with him, one of the things in this conversation, he asked Gandhi what he ought to do or what he should take back to the United States. And interesting, Gandhi said to him that he regretted not being able to have made nonviolence more visible in a practice worldwide. And he said it was truly going to be some American black person who would succeed in doing this where he had felt that he had failed. These were Gandhi's beliefs. Now this is prophetic because this is before Martin Luther King was ever born. Speaking to Howard Thurman, who then later became Dr. King's mentor, but that came later. I'll talk about that in a minute. In 1944, Thurman left his tenured position at Howard to take on a pastor. So he was not only a wise theologian, he was also a pastor. He moved to San Francisco and helped form the Church for the Fellowship of All Peoples. And it was the first racially integrated intercultural church in 
But then in 1958, God had another plan and called him to Boston University, where they invited him to become the dean of the Marsh Chapel. He served from 1953 to 1965, and he was the first black person to be named to a tenured dean of chapel at a majority white university. Now, while he was there, he had the opportunity to mentor Dr. King. Now, I mentioned last week that it wasn't the first time that he had known who he was. He went to seminary with Dr. King's father, so they knew one another. But by the time that he was back and, and at Boston University, he had developed, finally, what we now call today liberation theology, at a time when no one knew what that word was. Because he started with this radical idea of talking about Jesus as a human in his own time, and that would have had an impact to his words. Until then, we had in the majority of the Western church taken Jesus right out of his historical context. And when you take things and ideas out of the historical context, you can make them say all sorts of things. Amen. And we have. And it is then that he figured out that there is a difference between the church and the institution of the church and the faith of Jesus Christ that he was sharing. So out of his time, he developed this clear idea of what I like to refer to as revolutionary spirituality. The reason it's revolutionary is it's this idea that the status quo as it is cannot stand. When we gather each week and we pray, your will be done. In the Lord's Prayer, we are calling that the current arrangements of things are not the way they're supposed to be. And I think if we're all honest with one another, we know that to be true. Yes. Yes. But Thurman wasn't just interested in developing a deeper spiritual life. He was interested in actually making that inform our actual life outside. That they were integrated fully in us as people. He understood the need for us to deal with our own personal as well as our cultural ones. Because the truth of the matter is that battle really is grown from the same root. Yes. We have a fancy way of talking about this in, in our tradition. It's called original sin. Um, I won't get into all of that today. But the truth of the matter is, is that we are all broken people. We live in a broken society. And those are things we all understand, whether we understand the theological language or not. We don't need that. All right, all right. We cannot deal without one. We can't deal with one without dealing with the that's other. Right, that's right. We have to work on both. And so all of his theology begins by placing Jesus in his historical setting. And he comes down to three basic things that I talked about in detail last week that I will just briefly glance at. One is that Jesus was a Jew. He never said he stopped being Jewish. He was poor. Because he lived in the hill country, his pit family, we often say carpenters. What we know is there were no trees around there, so he probably was a stonemason. And probably his family were all day laborers. We all know what that is, folks who are jumping on, trying to pick up a day's worth of work. That's probably the kinds of work that Jesus' family grew up in. And then the last one is that Jesus was a minority. He lived in the Roman Empire. And they were the only province that the Romans could never quite fully get them to comply. Mm -hmm. And so there was a revolutionary fervor in Jesus' life. And he had to struggle with that reality. And then the development of Thurman's work goes further as it was encountered with God. He knew the simple truth that what we say and what we believe are linked. That how we live ought to be connected with what we believe. Just because we've got our theology well written, it doesn't mean anything if it doesn't have roots and wings. Amen. Amen. His theology was written with one idea in mind, and this was it. What does the religion of Jesus have to say to those whose backs are against the wall? People, as he said, in oppressed communities. And that is where he begins all of his theology. And so this week, I want to talk about the three things that he says exist when the power arrangements aren't the way that they are supposed to be. Those three things are one is fear, deception, and hatred. Now, I think they could be named in a lot of different ways, and in fact, they overlap a good point. But I think he does a good job of using these three, so that's what I will do as well. The first one is this idea that the truth is that so often our society is drenched in 
fear. Fear of the other. Fear of violence. Whether it be from the state or whether it be from our neighbors. We live in fear. And the threat of fear alone, the threat of violence, will keep people in a perpetual state of fear. So much so that at some point you will commit to memory the way to ensure to avoid facing violence. What to do when you get stopped by the police because you're driving in the wrong municipality in St. Louis. Ultimately, the fear in the weak exists as well in the strong. This fear permeates all sections of society to where we then hypersexualize black men or turn them into villains all the time. And then the gospel comes along, as Thurman says, and says it begins with these words Do not fear. And those words came to a people who were fearful folk. Mary was a young child. Elizabeth, who heard those words as well. The shepherds in the field, these were all folks who were not powerful folks. These were folks that understood what fear was like on some level. And the truth is, when the gospel says it, it says, do not fear because you are not defined by all of those categories. You are a child of God. And because of that, it can provide a level of giving up our fear. You see, the problem with fear and that it ultimately plays on all of our personal insecurities as well. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And so when we face that fear, we end up probably falling into ego problems. We either shrink back as if we have nothing to offer the world, or we become boisterous and overcompensate for all the things that we feel we're not. And learning to hear the gospel voice says, I don't about the fear from without. And this is why in our confessions we've often said, fear God alone. Not because God is someone who we need to cower from and fear, but if we only fear God, then we don't have to fear the little gods of the world around us. Now that's dangerous, because if we give up our fear, we might face the same face that Jesus ended up with on the cross. The gospel says, do not fear. And the things that come as a result of fear, Jesus knew well. It was one of the oldest tools that the weak have always used to fool the strong. That brings me to the second point. Unequal relationships are always the breeding ground of deception. Lack of honesty. The, oh, he's my friend. No, he's just smiling and inside really hates you. But he's doing it because he has to survive. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, help us. Help us, Lord. It's true. Mm. And so Thurman spends a lot of time talking about folks who use deception to keep themselves alive. Yes. Mm. And it opens up a whole conversation for those in power to go, oh, wait, what? <laughs> Is that what's happening? And we're not in those same places, but it still exists plenty of times. But the problem, he says, is that if that is how we are going to deal with one another over time, deception leads us to become deceptive people, and we lose contact with the image of God in us. So it's not so much about the other. It is about how we will survive as not learning, as unlearning the ways of being deceptive. It's the idea of living with un wavering sincerity. To not worry about what the results are going to be because the truth is things might not change at all, but you can keep from becoming the fear and deception around us. And the truth is, for those of us in a community trying to continue to build a community, the longer we work on deception, the less community that we have. We think so and so is our great friend, but the truth is, as long as they fit within a particular way of acting, this is what made the Jim Crow South the work the way it did. You had plenty of folks go, well, I don't understand. All the black folk down here seem quite happy. <coughs> and they believed that because the deception had worked. 
and it had kept at least some folks alive, but not all, because it doesn't always work anyway. And Thurman, writing in 1940, 39, said that we have to give this up. And Gandhi even taught him and said, at some point, you have to live honestly as you possibly can. Amen. And let the chips fall where they may. Yes. The giving up of fear, finally, on some level, can lead us to live in very honest ways. So this process then leads to his final point, which is we start with fear that leads to deception and finally leads in its ultimate form to hatred. And hatred is something we're all very familiar with because in times of war, this is a quote, in times of war, hatred becomes quite respectable. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. We've been at war for over 11 years. We're about to work up the whole population into another war. And then another one. And so hatred becomes just part of the land we live in. We don't even realize anymore that the way that people are ripping one another to shreds on network television is really just vicious hatred language. And it infects all of us. So how do we speak truth? How do we live without fear? And how do we not fall victims to hatred? Because the truth is that hatred is powerful. And in its early stages, hatred has a lot of creativity that is born out of it. And hatred in those who are disinherited, as the language of Herman said, is born out of great bitterness. And then on some level, all of us can fall trapped to this. Hatred can become the source of our identity for whatever happened to us along the way. And we feed that, and we nurture it, and then it becomes who we are. And as I said, it can be a powerful, creative force, but at some point, here's the problem with hatred. Once it's unleashed, it can't be controlled. I often wonder if all of the energy that's been put into the Tea Party and others has got the GOP figuring out what they're supposed to do now they're in charge. They can't control the folks that they use to get into power. There was a lot of hatred in the Tea Party. But the Republicans don't have a corner on hatred, friends. Just wait. You get those Democratic mailings when they say, you know, you, it scratched the surface. It happens to all of us. But it can't be controlled once it's unleashed. When violence comes to the fore, born out of hatred, death will come. But in the end, and we know this, if we look at the history of revolutions, hatred always turns on its parents. It turns on its children. It leads to paranoia, and it ends creativity and openness. Eventually, the French Revolution executed all of its heroes. And in the end, hatred kills our spirits. It keeps us from really being fully children. Thurman understood that in looking at Jesus, Jesus surely understood all of these things too. And so he prays, Jesus, and he speaks truth. At the beginning of Jesus' ministry, he's thrown out into the wilderness. Once he gets this calling, he realizes that his life is to be lived out in love, and love is a terrible, hard thing. And so he goes out for 40 days to pray and to get himself right. And when he finally goes back to his hometown and preaches the spirit recovery of sight to the blind, they try to throw him off a cliff. And we preach that and don't think twice of it. Oh, Lord, help us, help us, Lord. <laughs> Jesus understood and yet spoke truth anyway. He played some games along the way, too. About how did you maintain a sense of dignity in the midst of all of this? I want to share two stories. One is when he faces Herod, Herod or when he faces Pilate. Pilate says, are you the king of the Jews? And his response is, you say that I am. Mm -hmm. It's a grand sort of, I'm not answering your question. I'm refusing to participate in your court because I don't see its validity. But I am here. That's some powerful stuff with some crazy implications. I had talked to Lawson ahead of time, so I was going to ask him if he'd take a swing with me. 
Will you come and help me this morning? The, the, I want to mention this only uh, uh, for... He's going to get more time. Jesus at one point, and this is about the issue of dignity. How do you take level of this? And I've talked about it before, but it's worth saying again. Jesus talks about where he says, turn the other cheek. It's this idea that we are, if we're not careful, doormats. As a child, I thought, that's the dumbest thing I ever wanted to hear. I don't really hear this. I, there has to be some level of this. And Jesus isn't telling people who are already struggling to take it more. To just be patient. Just wait and things will eventually change. Don't act like that or this will happen. Don't cause trouble. That's not what Jesus was saying at all. So if when, Je when Jesus says, turn the other cheek, the person who was being hit was always being slapped by someone who was in a position of higher power and authority. So if they were to do that, we're facing one another, and he was to slap, he'd slap me with the back of his hand, and I would turn my face this way. When Jesus says, turn the other cheek, the, the Greek language is actually offer the other cheek in a way that's confrontational. So he slaps me, and I now turn this way, sticking it out. And he has an opportunity at this point to do one of two things. He cannot hit me with his left hand, because in that culture, you would not hit with the left hand. So he can't backhand me. And a backhand hit was always the kind of hit that would be to, from someone who was in a position of authority to someone who was of a lesser station in life. Now, if I offer the cheek, it's a confrontational act, and he has a choice. He can either do one of two things, and either way, he loses. If he hits me, now I've offered my cheek, if he hits me with the inside part of his hand, it's a sign and a symbol that we are equals. And he don't want to do that, right? And if he does, then he has to pay a fine. Mm -hmm. Or he can walk away. <laughs> Or he can walk away. And I have now openly challenged him in front of people. And the humiliation that has come upon the left has been taken away in a way that was creative and didn't cost me my life. This is what Jesus is trying to teach to folks, is to say we've got to get our insides right. Because the truth is, I know myself well. You take a backhanded swing at me, and I'm coming back at you. So I'm praying about that. And that's part of why, during the Civil Rights Movement, you don't have to continue to stand up. I'm afraid you might take this away from me. Um, but during the Civil Rights Movement, there were people who were not allowed to go and be on the front line of action until they knew that folks were capable of handling that high-stress situation without becoming the violence and the hatred that they were standing against. This is the struggle that our faith teaches us. This is the message that I think is eternal. We can bring this up a hundred years from now, unfortunately, and it will still be timely as it is today, not just in the United States, but in St. Louis, with all our struggles. There are ways for us, not to keep our place or to keep our tongue, but to figure out how to do things creatively and undermining the places where death lives and acting as a voice for true revolutionary mm. yes. life yes. Yes. in the faith we share in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.